The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual co-host and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Firearms Radio Network and or their employers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is especially true on our live shows. Broadcast for shooters, hunters, and gun enthusiasts, this is the Firearms Radio Network. The bandwidth for this episode of This Week in Guns is sponsored by Patriot Patch Company. PatriotPatch.co Welcome to This Week in Guns. This show is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network and Patriot Patch Company. And this show offers commentary on the latest firearms industry news, information, and buzz. I'm your host, Sean Heron, and it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists tonight. Uh, returning many times and a personal favorite of mine, we've got historical firearms researcher and host of CN Arsenal's Primer, Small Arms of World War One series, Othias McCarthy. Welcome back. Howdy. Glad to have you, buddy. And next up, a good friend of mine, but a newbie to the show. He's a national Second Amendment advocate, grassroots example, school safety proponent, and NRA director. And here's my disclaimer. Tim Knight is not an official spokesperson for any group or association. His views are his own. Tim Knight, welcome to the hey, show. Thanks for having me, Sean. Glad to have you. Glad to have you both. Before we get into it, I want people to go check out the Patriot Patch Company. You might remember Jake. He hosted the show forever. And he runs Patriot Patch Companies out now. So go to patriotpatch.co and uh, check out their Patch of the Month Club. It is pretty awesome. Let's go ahead and get right into the stories tonight, guys. Firearms Interstate Commerce Reform Act introduced. This comes to us from the NSSF. And this basically would enable licensed dealers to transfer firearms, rifles, shotguns, and handguns to out-of-state buyers so long as the transaction complies with the laws of the state of both the transferer and the transferee. Permit licensed retailers to sell firearms at out-of-state gun shows, provided that the laws of the state of both the transferer and the transferee are complied with, and allow for face-to-face transfer of firearms between licensed dealers. Currently, dealers must ship a firearm, significantly increasing the risk of theft in the process. And, very interesting, Tim, as our newbie, I'm going to start off with you. What are your thoughts on this whole thing? I'm a big fan. A background check is supposed to be a background check, ultimately. The the sticky wicket here, I think, is... People seem to be concerned about, well, okay, so I'm visiting in Colorado and I buy, want to buy a new Glock, pick a number. And um, you don't know what the, the FFL, are they supposed to know the rules in Connecticut? So that's where it can become a problem. I like this. This is good. This is the right direction. I see it becoming a headache for some dealers, that, yeah. that ultimately. But is it is it the right direction? Sure. Now, is the, <clears throat> it doesn't seem like the burden would be on the buyer the way it's written. Perhaps I'm wrong about that. No, I, I agree with that assessment. Uh, Athias? Yeah, uh, anytime you can make this a little more streamlined is better. I, what I've never understood about the um, the background check system is that there's not a lot that's being done to make it easier to use. They actually seem to make it more complicated whenever they get a chance. And so my big thing is if you want to have every firearm transfer go through a background check, you should probably do the sort of business savvy way, which is to make it as easy as humanly possible so that the slightest amount of doubt in your mind and you reach for the background check. And so I've never understood why this system like Nix hasn't been opened up to the public or something like that for being able to be used for instantaneous checks. If that's the way they want to go, they should make it voluntary, but universal. And so something like this kind of touches in that direction, at least, which is that, Hey, we're going to make it a lot more common sense, straightforward. As long as the checks being made, then we don't mind. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. It should be open. And if you, want to sell a firearm to somebody and you're unsure because you're not allowed to sell it to uh, a criminal, some with a known record. And when you're asking if you're unsure and you want to have that option, why shouldn't people have that option for sure if they want it? Yeah, it's, it'd be nice because I actually live in a private sale state. And so we don't really have a lot of duties internally. Like I almost, I mean, especially for the old stuff I get into, it's very rare that I actually need to go through anything other than a private sale in state. And The idea that I can wander to North Carolina and Georgia and have legal purchases without any difficulty because someone has quick access to something like a NICS check, that's fine. That's not going to be much of an infringement at all. It's going to be a slight delay of a few moments of my time instead of this whole big form and this whole sort of, I don't know, there's an intimidation factor, I think, and I think they're kind of counting on it. As long as it remains optional. Right, right. But if it is optional, I, I don't see anybody... You'd have a very, very small number of fringe guys that avoid using that system, especially if once it becomes optional, there's a sort of inherent liability there. I'm not saying that you should be able to be sued, but there is an expectation that you could be looked upon negatively if you were to not use this system. You don't have to make it a legal repercussion. People generally want to be good, I assure you. 
Yeah, the way I read it, it, it definitely, Tim, you already mentioned this, but yeah, it puts a lot of burden on the FFL. Like they're supposed to know the laws in all 50 states. I mean, we can buy rifles right now and apparently that's how it already is. If you cross state lines, you can buy a long gun and yes. apparently that's how it already is. I'm not sure a lot of dealers actually know that or go buy it because they're supposed to go by the laws of the transferer and the transferee. So it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes. I'm with you guys on it. Next story, NFA changes fee reductions and dead red flag bill make Arkansas very pro 2A. So several different things happened. SB 400 repealed the prohibition on silenced firearms in its entirety. The old law made suppressed firearms prohibited weapons. It was technically illegal for the owner of a legal silencer to attach it to a firearm. It's all been repealed now. They also made it clear that National Firearms Act items such as short barreled shotguns, short barreled rifles, and fully automatic guns can be legally under the, under the NFA rules in Arkansas. And really just a, a lot of good stuff kind of going on there. And last but not least, they cut the fees for concealed carry permit in half. Uh, they are shall issue, but they're also uh, their constitutional carry as well. They have the permit just for reciprocity. They cut those fees from 100 to $50. And then for people 65 or older, the fee was reduced from 50 to 25 Good things. Othias, opinion? You know, I I could sit here and say, yeah, I agree with it on the legal side, but really what I'd like people to take away from something like this is if you live in Arkansas, it's very hard, uh, the way things are structured now, to take a moment and appreciate when somebody does something that goes your way. Instead, we sort of look at what we're arguing with and very infrequently reward what we agree with. So if you're in Arkansas and you like the direction of this, make sure you look up the people who are involved in this and support them the next time you have an election, because this is not just someone who's spewing platitudes that you want to hear. This is someone who's taking action. And so if these are your legislators, so I can't speak legislators and they're doing this for you, make sure that they know that you are happy with it. Cause I'm sure they mostly hear negative things in their uh, inboxes. Excellent point, Tim. Yeah. I want to add to that <laughs> and, and I'll say it several times tonight. Right. Uh, re- reach out to these folks. They, they're they stretching to include liberty, make it the barriers lower, permit people are being able to permit sooner. Let these legislators know they are supported by you because silence will mean, well, do we know, should we do more? Now, I think it's really interesting. I, you know, when I, I read down this list of stuff that was happening in Arkansas, it's opening the door for businesses. And, and, and is it CZ that's moving moving something to Arkansas. Yes. This is a good sign. They when want is CZ gonna, Is CZ going to produce guns now? <laughs> Apparently. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like, I just like, a, like I at a level that, that at a level that meets demand cuz that would be amazing. I, I don't know. I don't I don't remember Chon, do you remember the <laughs> Yeah, pick me. It is going to um, be a big manufacturing facility. They're adding quite a few jobs whether oh, it, whether it increases availability or not. We will see. <laughs> They're the most reluctant seller. Uh, everybody wants to buy your stuff. Uh, I guess we'll make like five more. Oh, okay. Caltech. <laughs> this is a really good direction. I, I think that this state is doing Arkansas, and and I'm hoping that more states start breaking that way. We're thinking, let's break down some of these barriers. Let's push towards freedom. And, and yeah, let's be sure and, and be vocal about our support everywhere <laughs> it's happening. I really want to reiterate, by the way, as a politician, because this is a point to hammer. When you take a proposition to legalize something especially let's let's take the suppressors for an issue the first time someone uses one of those improperly they're going to call back to you for having re-legalized it and so you take on a lot of personal sort of public liability in the sense of you will have the finger pointed at you and so i really encourage people to go ahead and say the positive things while you can because you put your neck out pretty wide to give people back some of their liberty. I know it doesn't seem like it that way, but when you're in that hot seat and all you hear are complaints, you're just trying to make the least number of complaints. Yep. True statement. Next inventor is appealing his machine gun parts conviction because he was not allowed to testify. I had several different emotions as I read this story and and I'm pretty sure that I've heard about it before. Uh, But this is a guy, his name's Scott Ray Bishop and there's a website that he had where he sold these conversion devices. He actually had a video on his website and he, there was a masked man identified as Nunya Bidness firing a semi-automatic rifle. He then inserts a small device into the gun and showed how it could then fire on fully automatic. He right now is serving a 33 month federal prison sentence in Colorado for making and selling illegal machine guns via his kits. They say that his con- they violated his constitutional rights by not letting him testify about how his invention worked and what he intended to do. He did represent himself at trial and then 
they actually blocked him from testifying because he did not notify the prosecution of his plans to offer expert testimony to which I'm like, okay, you know, first off, get a good lawyer. Second off, that's a bunch of BS. And then I read further and basically he was part of a sting by an ATF agent. They meet in a parking lot off interstate 15 and the agent recorded the conversation. The agent asked Bishop if he knew anything about modifications like full auto stuff. Bishop responded, I've got a few of them and I don't have a problem telling people I've got full auto. He said, it's not legal, but I'm not one that is concerned about that. And like I said, I had a few different emotions on this one. Um, you know, if he really thought that he was making something and they talk about the fluidity of ATF regulations uh, between 2007 and 2000, or I'm sorry, 2008 and 2017 on the definition of automatic weapons and agreed that they're confusing, but also at the same time, I'm not a hundred percent sure that he wasn't knowingly violating this. Tim Knight, I'll start off with you. Yeah. Knowingly violate. There we go. We'll start with that. Is the audio good? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Don't encourage you to do something wrong. And I, and when reading this article, the thing that really interested me besides what you just said is, you know, he walked into a, a sting was, you know, don't represent yourself in court. Uh, uh-uh, don't be doing that. Yeah. This was a tricky thing. It took me a while. Like I read the story twice and went, wait, he did what now? Uh, and it, when it, where it said, well, he didn't mind doing full auto and doing that. Well, I guess he knew the consequences then. So, yeah. yeah. So, and I was like, you know, like I said, I started off and I was like, oh, down with the government. And then I was like, dude, come on. Othias? So I think you have two issues. You have someone who's testing the limits and you can get burned testing the limits and he's cognizant of that. So I think if you remove the sort of the ethical issue of did he knowingly put himself in this position? Well, he probably knowingly, but I'd have to look at the device. He says it was to force reset the trigger recycling between shots. Is this that little piece of steel that I'm thinking of? Is that what I'm imagining? Or well, It could be. And I actually thought back to TACCON, uh, if you guys remember those triggers that basically had a, it wasn't, I'd know. have to see it. That's the short answer. Yeah. I, I would need to see the device to understand. But whether he put his foot in it or not, that's that's between him and himself as to whether or not he put his foot in this trap. But um, I think this whole case sort of highlights where we're having problems. Because even this article talks about bump stocks and things like that. I think we're having a real hard time pinning down what is it to be automatic fire. And the thing that most people don't realize from the outside view is that it's more complicated to produce a semi-automatic gun than an automatic one for the most part. Like, when you talk about a submachine gun, the simplest form is a mass with a firing pin set inside a tube with a barrel on the end and a single sear engagement that you either hold or you don't hold. I mean, you can go to Lowe's and make one in a matter of hours using, like, some fence pole and stuff. So the, the, the problem is people think of machine gun as being a step above a semi-automatic in terms of technology. It's not. It's usually a step down. Now, making it controllable and sustainable, and all, yes, there's other issues there because you you introduce a lot more fire. But the thing is, when you start to try to regulate that idea that we need to put in these extra things, well, then it gets really complicated because people will inherently find a way to very quickly dumb the system back down into being automatic fire. And so, what constitute constructive intent? You know, there's there's things like. Uh, what is it? M2 carbine receivers that come into the market that must be cut in half now because they're considered machine guns because there's a hole drilled in the side of them. And that's, that's it. There's a hole drilled in the side of them. That's so easily replicable that it's laughable that those receivers are considered machine gun receivers. Whereas you should just regulate perhaps the parts that fit there, which they also try to do. So again, you, it's whack-a-mole and the more people get inventive with it, the more you're going to have to play whack-a-mole. And so I suspect that there's an inherent difficulty with the original law and you're going to have to either come down to defining a fire rate or you're going to have to back off regulating machine guns. Those are essentially your two choices as you get further and further into it because it's going to get more and more complicated. And do we want Congress doing that or do we want the ATF doing that? Cause I don't really want either one doing that, but yeah. that, that ultimately is what has come up. Well, the problem is if you have doing that. If you try to regulate fire rate, you're going to have to like register Jerry Mikulik. Like, I mean, it's a joke, <laughs> but it's true though. There, there is an element of what can you do with skill, you know, and it, it gets really tricky. I agree. Next story. And it's just one that I repeat because I see a trend happening across the U S and this is another one where my emotions were uh, in a few different places. Three New York teens arrested for plotting to bomb their high school. Uh, this is in long Island. They were 16 year old students in Suffolk County. And they were discussing a bombing plot during their bus ride home on May 1st. 
Police searched the teen's home and discovered a copy of the Anarchist Cookbook, a publication that contains instructions on about how to build homemade explosives. No explosive devices were found. All three teens were arrested on charges of conspiracy in the fourth degree. Got a lot to say, but I'm going to start off with Tim. What do you think? Ah, teenagers. Um, <laughs> this um, is disappointing. Uh, you, you'd like to think the teenagers were focused on – I mean I was a teenager. We've all been there and we've done that. But I certainly didn't think about this kind of stuff. Uh, is this a parenting thing? Is this where we're not paying attention to our kids and letting them do it? I know, Sean, you have kids. So, hmm, uh, you know, and, and talking about it, did they want to get caught? Um, I'm glad they did get caught. This is – we're seeing a lot more of this, and maybe that's why you did it, is is to bring up the example of we need to be paying attention to our kids and what's going on. And I, the picture included in the story, even those things are are, are disturbing. So is it a societal thing? I, I, I don't have the answer to it, although I do know that we need to be paying a lot more attention to our kids and what's going on. And thankfully, I think this is part of the reason why it was discovered was because somebody was paying attention going, you know, that's just not right. We're not okay with that. So. I don't know. I'm curious to what Matthias has to say on the topic. Uh, I'm the exact opposite. I would actually need to have heard that conversation, understand it in context, because these sound like edgy kids to me. Like, uh, I just, I, I was sort of the, one of the offshoot kids in high school. I didn't fit in very well. And I just remember all sorts of, not me personally, because I was a little more even tempered, but like, I definitely knew the kids that would like, they'd puff up about like, well, I could kill him in his sleep and he'd never know. Like they just, it's an insecurity thing tied to this sort of need to be a rogue. And it happens a lot with teenage males. And I'm looking at this photo and I see like a BB gun, what appears to be maybe a lever action 22, but it's probably another BB gun. I see a very weird looking Luger that uh, it's, the, I can't get the image any bigger, but it doesn't look right to me. I, it might again be a pellet gun or something. And a couple of like edgy books about serial killers in the anarchist cookbook. I mean, I've seen seven copies of that book before I hit age 20, just with the kids I hung out with. Like they all wanted to be something, you know, that they weren't. And a lot of it is, it's almost a form of cowardice of avoiding sort of naturalizing to your own community. It's a, it's a way of avoiding engaging in your own community to sort of put yourself distant and above. And if it goes too far, yes, they will actually become dangerous. Although that's extremely rare. 99 out of 100 of them either just never really click with people and just end up being, let's be frank, losers for a long time, or they sort of settle in, which is I was more towards that side anyway, and I settled into being a normal, productive human being. And I think there's ways to handle this that involve reaching out and uh, coaching and maybe teaching them to actually build things instead of tear them down. A lot of that tearing down is a, a natural result of not know how, knowing how to actually build anything up. But yes, you should keep an eye out for the ones that are going to break in that other direction. So I'm not against them being investigated for this thing. I just hate the way it's all presented that they were obviously dangerous when in reality they just had the potential to cut either way and they could either be redeemed or determined to be actually dangerous. And I'd like to know a lot more about this. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at a photo of a stick with a quarter of a circular saw made yeah. into an axe. And I'm thinking I had way more dangerous crap laying around just growing up in the South. Like we had sheds full of like, machetes and stuff for cutting back bush that we would go out and cut back bush and cut trails and then horse around like idiots. I'm surprised we all lived, but I, I, I don't you hit know. the nail on the head though. I mean, you're talking about engagement, really. We were talking about different ways of being engaged, but engagement, you know, if you, the, the outlier, I was kind of an outlier in my own way. I, someone was joking with the other day and they said, Oh, you must've been a hoot in high school. And I'm like, no, I didn't stop carrying a briefcase till I was 32. Uh, <laughs> so that included high school, but uh, you know, it, 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 um, I think it's the engagement part. You said where you were able to engage them to do things or want to do things or include them. And, and you know, in the high school, we all know the kid who just wanted to be left alone and had read dark books and said maybe some dumb things. And this is probably an offshoot of that. I think you nailed that. But uh, I think do, uh, paying attention, which we both agreed is something we should do. So, you know, is there parenting involved? But this is that whole bullying culture we're going through. Um, you know, you can be part of the problem or part of the solution. If you see somebody struggling, take the time to get to know them or try. I, I think that's all we can do is try. Well, bullying has changed. It's interesting, but I almost, there's elements of bullying that I experienced when I was a kid that were definitely purely negative. And then there were elements of it that were more, I don't know, camaraderie that you just don't know how to interpret when you're the outside kid. Sure. And so there's an element of normalization and there's an element of taking it too far. But I think what's really happened though, is we've started to, especially because we have this identity culture that's emerged, we're starting to label kids 
Mm-hmm. And I worry about labeling because that becomes much more permanent. People really start to associate with their labels. And if a kid can't feel like they can cross from one label to another, then they're never going to grow. Honestly, yep. honestly, when I was a teenager, uh, several of these books, I know, like I was very interested in crime scene investigation and forensic analysis. I was fascinated by reading about serial killers and things like that. And it wasn't that I wanted to do it or I found them heroic or anything. I was just very interested in crime and the solving of crimes and, and the justifications that people would put forth as to why they did things. And I think about that back now and, and I was bullied, uh, I had to transfer schools, but I fought every day, uh, because I wasn't going to be bullied. And it's interesting. I think about like my childhood, I was literally looking at those books and I was like, Oh crap, I need to buy those. Those look pretty cool. <laughs> and it's not because I'm, you know, uh, an unbalanced, okay. I'm unbalanced, but not in that way. I don't want to hurt people, but those are all things that I would be interested in. I have read that Manson book. Uh, and again, not because I look at him like a heroic person or a heroic figure, but just because I'm curious about what makes the criminal mind tick. So yeah, I, I'm with both of you. There, There's parenting stuff that's going on, but also I wonder if we're too minority report about things. And it's the reason I bring this up because we see this just about every single week. I bring it up in just about every show because it concerns me in the direction that we're moving. Yeah, I don't know. I hear a lot about let's get the firearms out of schools, and I really think we should get the power tools back into schools and see if that helps. Like, I just think people have gotten too good at breaking stuff versus building stuff. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Colorado Gun Rights Group takes aim at red flag laws. It's a group that I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, I believe it's RMGO, if I remember correctly. Yes, it is. And they are going to file lawsuits against the Colorado red flag laws. They believe that the red flag law is unconstitutional itself. And uh, this was, let's see, this was signed in by Governor Polis, and it, it is a bad, bad law. It, it allows family, household members, law enforcement to petition a court to have guns seized or surrendered, and then it's up to the the person to – the burden of proof is put on the gun owner to get the firearms back by showing he or she no longer poses a risk or ever posed a risk. The law is garbage. I am glad to see a lawsuit filed. It's a little bit bittersweet because I, I don't like RMGO so much. I don't know. Tim, what do you think? Well, this is one of those few times where I actually agree with Dudley Brown and RMGO. And uh, my favorite line to that whole story is the last sentence. Two Democrats were called and another resigned for voting in favor of these laws in 2013. Uh, but it, what it doesn't do in 2013 and what it's not doing now is preventing politicians from passing these laws and thinking this stuff through. Yeah. So I'm glad to see there's a challenge. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a fundraising component to this from Dudley Brown. But Frankly, good, because these, these laws are not going to work. That We've already proven that in Maryland. California is doubling down on stupid, and apparently uh, Colorado is doing the same. So this is a bad path, and to, to get cleared of this is a monumental task. I'm, I'm, it's going to happen uh, where someone's going to ha- you know, have be accused of something, and that path is – it's not going to be pretty, and it's going to be ultimately a function of money. They're going to be, people are going to lose their rights and lose them permanently because they can't afford to fight this. Now, Tim, I, I, I don't want to stop, go away without giving a little bit of a shout out. You mentioned the last line: two Democrats were recalled, and another resigned for voting in favor of those laws. Did, did you have something to do with that? I don't, I don't recall. It's true, I might have. I did. Yeah, <laughs> a very large a part. bit. Yeah, I, 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 I filed the initial paperwork to start the recalls in Colorado, and I had a team. But you know, honestly, Sean, as you well know. There's no way that could have ever happened without engaged citizens in Colorado. Didn't do it by ourselves. And that's what it's going to take to fight this back is to support this lawsuit. Uh, I'm glad to see they're doing it. But Colorado citizens are going to have to reevaluate who they're voting for, who are passing these laws. That has to change because you've taken due process and put it in the wrong direction. There's no prior. It, it happens after the fact. And, and guys, I mean, that's straight up unconstitutional and it will be challenged in court, I imagine. But there's going to have to be a test case, and nobody wants to be that. No kidding. Oh, Thias? Well, I don't know. Where was the gentleman at that already managed to get into a gunfight and shot when they tried to confiscate on a red flag? Was it that? Massachusetts? Maryland. 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 That's right. Yeah. So we've already had a consequence of this. And so here's here's the issue. I can sit here and agree with you, but that's not going to make for interesting podcasting. So... <laughs> Let's play, let's play this game. If, if you're trying to appease the people who advocate for this kind of thing, what do you think is the measure by which someone should have their Second Amendment right taken away? What is the indication? Like, what is the actual red flag that you would want a judge to find and then have that judge decide that person is not acceptable to carry around a firearm? 
So c- can we go back to the Florida example where that young man was visited like 40 times by law enforcement? And a lot of times what you'll find is law enforcement will go make a visit on a house, but they don't want to write the notes for the visit because they'll afraid be afraid that that's brought up in court. And then it'll be used against or to prejudice people. So uh, I think their intention was to create a process where there would be a way for law enforcement to be able to do their job and do this. The problem is, is that I think what happened is they took proper adjudication out of the picture and reversed it. So should there be a process? Well, clearly there should be because it failed in Florida. The politicians ran straight past common sense straight into we think we're going to make everyone safer, except those politicians aren't standing in front of our high schools or our homes defending it, uh, nor can police officers be everywhere. So this was their intention. It just it took it way too far and stepped way beyond the constitutional realm to do it, in my opinion. I agree. Okay. Like, I just – that's going to be the question everybody wants to answer, though, is where is the line? And so, for me, honestly, I draw it – I mean, I'm vaguely libertarian about most things, so it's way back. I think individual responsibility is still very high. I think that if you want a an actual defense this sort of thing, you have to provide a manifest defense in the environment, but uh, there's people that are not going to be happy about that or they're going to want more, and so I think it's just always – Whenever you're thinking about these issues, you might want to start taking into account what the other person is going to think immediately when you say, hey, we, we're we not going to allow a red flag. And then they go, OK, but what are you giving us to defend the situation? Well, and the OK part, I think, is the part that's really key here is to we're having a lot of states like California, Colorado, Maryland uh, and others are going to give us very bad examples of what not to do. But in Ohio, uh, despite the governor's uh, attempt to do that. It has been pointed out to the governor that there are processes and that they should be used and followed through. So we're going to have kind of the 50 state experiment, some really bad ideas and some some rather proficient good ones that will explain how we should do it. And hopefully legislators will understand that there are tools available to them and law enforcement and the proper adjudication. Because I'm with you. We should definitely default on the side of the citizen until we cannot until it crosses that line of safety of many others or others before we have to do that. And then it should be done prior. It should be an open process in court where that person has a chance to defend themselves as opposed to it happening afterwards. I realize that's not the easy way to do it, but it's the correct way to do it. Well said. Next story is a a sad one. Uh, Just 70 miles north of us here in Colorado Springs, Colorado, two in custody, one dead, eight injured in a Colorado school shooting. This happened at uh, a K through 12 school that was eight miles from Columbine high school. They finally announced one fatality late last night and some things are, some things are coming out. So apparently it was two killers, an 18 year old and then a minor. And it appears that the minor is a female that identifies by male pronouns is what it appears right now. They walked in, they went to two separate classrooms, they closed the door, and then they they did the evil that they that they were planning to do. So I've read a few things here, and I want to say a couple names right this second. Kendrick Castillo and Brendan Bialy. And the reason that I want to say those names right now is because I think they're extremely important. And I'm going to say another name right now. Riley Howell. You may remember from last week's show, uh, UNCC. They had a, a person walk into a classroom and start shooting and a gentleman, a young man named Riley Howell charged and, and went after the gunman. And the resultant effect of that was that the gunman was uh, occupied long enough to let the other people run out of the class and to let people escape and to give the police time to get there. And then they were taken. Then they took him into custody in Colorado. It seems like the exact same thing happened. The young man that was killed, Kendrick Castillo, he lunged at the shooter and then multiple students attacked the shooters as well, uh, the killers as well. And that's two in a row. And I think that what we, what we preach all the time, I almost cussed is that we cannot just let these people walk into our schools and, and, and do what they will and that we need to fight back and people are starting to fight back. And you know what happens? these pieces of human garbage will eventually understand that it's no longer fish in a barrel, that people are going to start fighting back and people are going to take their garbage butts out. And I I think that's a fantastic thing. And that's two stories in a row. And man, I'm, I'm so glad that, that people are fighting back because that is the thing that will stop 
these these killers from doing what they do. Thias, I'll start with you. Uh, I think I'd agree. So the problem you have is if you want sort of a micro version of this, that's a little dramatic. If you look at sort of like the 9-11 situation where you had two planes strike a building and then the next plane was alerted that this may happen, that the hijacking, because everybody was on along for the ride when it was a hijacking. They said, look, we'll do what they say. Common sense tells us at this point that if we do this, we'll get out of it okay. And then by the time we would have had a third strike, that third group of people were like, we're already, we're done. We're called for. And the damage here is what it is we can do something to mitigate that damage and it's noble and it's a sacrifice. And I'm not saying it's one that anybody should have to make. That's not, we're not calling for people to have to do this. The problem is once it has been begun, begun by someone with malicious intent who has forced the issue, someone who is way outside of our law, way outside of our morals. Once it is begun, you have fractions of a second to end it. And so if you are there and you are taking the hit anyway, you might as well be aggressive. You might as well be assertive. You might as well mitigate as much of that damage as you can because the sacrifice on your part is practically all already made. Now, I understand that for the next people, the next people that are four, five, six, twenty 20 feet away, now there's some decisions for them to make because they can flee with a percentage chance. They can attack with a percentage chance. This is a math that is being armchair quarterback, and I don't want to necessarily judge any individual person for it. But I think as a society, if we are ready to fight, we will suppress these threats much faster. They will rack up fewer numbers. They will have less celebrity, and the issue will dwindle down on that front. But that is only one facet. It is not a solution to the problem. It is just a way to keep... It is a fire break. It is not a way to stop the fire from starting. It is a way to keep it from spreading. Tim? I'm just going to add to what he said because it was all, I think, pretty spot on. What are we going to do next? And that question needs to be asked at every school. Every parent, every administrator needs to figure out what they're going to do. And this evaluation happens quite often, and more often than not, they want to pave the way with good wishes. And no parent uh, wants to put their child on a school bus and wonder, or drop their kid off at school, or an administrator wonder, might it happen today? Anywhere in the world, nobody wants that. So how we deal with that? What do we do when we add a collection of people and make, make an environment where we've passed laws to say, basically, you can't do anything about it. You can't defend this place. Well, that tells evil people this place is prime and ripe for that. And I am so against that. I've spent years with my friend Judson Crossland and actually working uh, in parallel programs with you, Sean Heron, and how we deal with these things and how perhaps we, we respond to it. But what also needs to happen is what do we as teachers, as parents, choose to do? And some schools, uh, Ohio's quite famous for it with their faster program where they have armed teachers. Texas has an armed teacher program in certain, certain places. And so does Utah. And even in Colorado, there is a program that, that arms, I guess it's mostly private schools and magnet schools. Now they have choices and these places need to do that. No parent wants to hear this story. No one wants to hear it. So what are we going to do? Now, what politicians tend to do is, draw bigger lines with wider zones and put up bigger signs saying, do not do you know, bad people don't come here. That hasn't worked. It's never going to work. Colorado has many unfortunate examples of that as do many other places. So what are we going to do? Are we going to change the protocol of who we let in the building and at what time and how they get in? And do you know them? And are the teachers armed? Is there an evacuation plan? These things need to be planned and talked about. And what I find is that generally when people show up and want to have those conversations, people go, oh, this is political or this is an NRA program or, you know, we don't want that here. Okay, well, nobody wants the evil there. So, you know, I'm not interested in rolling the dice. I've actually moved my child from one school to another over security concerns because they, for three years, didn't take her proper precautions. So I moved him to a, a different school that did. So there's a lot going on here. There's no easy answer. And I, uh, this is going to be a continuing story in every school and every teacher, every administrator, every school district. They're all going to have to look at this until they do something about it. All said. So again, I just want to reiterate those names because I think they're important. Riley Howell, Kendra Castillo, and Brendan Bialy, who is a current pulley in the Marine Corps, Marine Corps delayed entry program, by the way. So anyway, you know, thank you enough, Sean, ever. Yeah. All right. 
Next story. Tough to go to this one right after that one, but Nebraska man was shot in the genitals when he dropped his gun and it fired. True story. And I don't know. I don't know if it was a SIG P320, LOL, or, or, or really what happened, but uh, the police were called around 9 p.m. on Wednesday to a hospital and a report of a gunshot wound. They contacted a man who was suffering a non-life-threatening emergency. He was walking down the street, dropped his 22 caliber handgun, the gun fired, and it stuck him in the genitals. Uh, this one, I, I don't even know what to say. Uh, Tim? <laughs> Don't juggle your gun. Yeah. Wear a good holster. I don't I don't know what happened. And maybe don't carry a twenty two. Othias? I don't even believe it. Like unless it's like some old Lorson or something, like it's such a short article and I don't I just I know that it's a game of telephone. Like I know there's reporters and police <laughs> and other people involved. When they say he dropped his gun and it went off, I can almost guarantee you he caught it. Like every time this happens, especially if it hit him in the genitals. Because to me, that says he dropped it, it started to fall, he snags at it, it's right below the twig and berries as he grabs at it, his hand goes in the trigger guard, and boom. Like, it just, it screams negligent catch versus actually hitting rock hard ground and discharging. Uh, well, we saw the back flipping FBI agent, you know, exact thing. You go to grab. And I mean, it's one of the things we focus on in classes like, hey, if you drop your gun, do not try to grab it. Just let it drop because it is such a such a thing. Keith, you on the YouTube chat said we're in Nebraska. It's Lincoln, Nebraska. Hmm. I mean, I work with historical firearms that can discharge when dropped like those were issues 100 years ago, but they were being extensively tested and refined by the 19 teens by almost everyone. Like nobody liked the idea of a drop unsafe firearm in the 1920s. So we are, we are about a hundred years away from the last era of the drop, not safe firearms in excluding very, very rushed production in world war two. But if you're carrying some, you know, you know, emergency firearm that was made in the latter days of world war two as your personal piece, you have other issues. Yeah. Next story. Let's talk a bit about Venezuela. It's kind of a big thing in 2012. They, they, there was a gun ban put into place and it's really affected them because citizens are being shot at and ran over by governmental forces. And it's kind of a big deal that uh, we always say that, you know, the first step to removing freedoms and the first step to being dictators is to disallow the populace's ability to bear arms, uh, to overthrow tyrannical governments. We repeat it all the time. And it's, I guess, in my opinion, pretty infrequent that we see a perfect, example of why the second amendment matters so much in the United States. People say, well, you know, it'll never happen in the U S we'd never get this far, but you know what? It's, it's really a, a, a color by number book of exactly what happens when you take away the right of the people to rise up against the tyranny of a government. Tim, what are, what are your thoughts on Venezuela and the gun ban and just everything that's going on over there? <laughs> I think that December 15th, 1791 uh, rings really loudly. When they, when the Second Amendment was ratified, that that I'm pretty sure that's the date. Uh, this reminds us. You're right, Sean. We don't get a lot of uh, examples. We get a lot of, well, that can never happen here, or it won't. Oh, well, we have a modern day example yet again that shows that without an armed citizenry, the government or the dictator can do whatever they want. It, the Constitution is a shield. The one sharp part of that shield was given to us, uh, and. Yet again, current events are pointing out, hey, yeah, this is a really bad idea. Rocks against tanks, those odds suck. No doubt. Matthias? I'm going to say that they were guaranteed this situation by the fact that they did not tweet out enough mean things about the uh, sitting president. Uh, they probably should have voted to not be run over. Uh, it's their own fault if you don't vote for not getting run over because that's how you prevent tyranny is that you repeatedly ask the government to not be tyrannical and i think they forgot to keep asking for it to not be tyrannical and that's really the only way to prevent it there's no way firearms were ever going to help in this situation uh, we all know that the only thing you can do to stop uh, a would-be king or dictator is to just say please don't or i will shame you uh, publicly by calling you names <laughs> up your twitter game yeah, yeah. <laughs> honestly I'm, it's, it's the only defense mean, could, you, could you name anything that will actually stop a tyrant other than just being disapproved of because there's, there's not, there's no conceivable way that you could topple a government without, you know, just being really mad about it for a number of years. And then maybe some investigations. If it, <laughs> if it pleases the crown. Yeah. 
uh, for those people who don't know, Matthias is being extremely uh, sarcastic right now. And it was awesome. It was. Oh, man. All right. Well, let's talk a bit about the NRA. Scathing letter was published by former NRA staffer. LaPierre's travel expenses raised questions in RAAM falling out. Don't want to talk too much about it because another show on the Firearms Radio Network, We Like Shooting, uh, released uh, NRA Under Fire Episode 01 in their feed. And you can find that at firearmsradio.tv. Look at We Like Shooting. Then you can find that right on that page. Or subscribe to it, iTunes. Is this a uh, this is a serious breakdown of the issue that goes into detail? A very serious, with an extremely detailed timeline of everything that's kind of gone on uh, over the last couple of years. And could you say the name of that show again? It, <laughs> I know it's really, <laughs> really weird. But yes, it is. We like shooting that put that out, and it, you know, it was very interesting to do, and it was very fun to do because we're very interested. We went to the NRA annual meetings. We we saw firsthand or secondhand. Uh, a lot of the things that happened and this I think is a really good breakdown of a, what happened at the members meeting B a lot of the information that's out there and publicly available. The wall street Journal has put out an article with all the information in it as well. Uh, they're kind of all over the place. Othias, have you been keeping up with all this? And I don't know. I've been, I've been trying to, but so here's something that people don't understand about the NRA that they need to, there's a belief that the NRA First of all, there's a very reasonable belief that the best thing the NRA could do is be a single issue representative community. They should have, I have personally said, I think on, we like shooting a long ago was, uh, long, long ago, the NRA should not have backed Romney just because he had signed an assault weapons ban. They should be single issue. They should sit back and go, we are single issue. You will not get us unless you appeal to our issue. We understand that people in our organization have other things they care about, but our organization is single issue. This is the thing that people hope for from the NRA, whether they're voicing it that way or not. That's sort of what we expect of them. The problem is it hasn't actually ever really truly been that. Like in the history of the NRA, it started out clearly national rifle. Like it started out rifles, just, just rifle training. You know what I mean? And it's expanded and it's grown into different ways and it's adapted with the times. And so when people look at the NRA and they think of it as being very schizophrenic, well, yes, it's very ad hoc. Like it's an organization that sort of ballooned in one direction and shrank in others and just sort of moved throughout time. And so that you get into a situation like this, where you have a cascade of events in which they hit on something that worked. It it brought in donations. It brought in success. They rolled with it. It stopped. They've gone off message. They've lost the thread of what's going on. But basically, their feelers, from my perspective anyway, their feelers are broken. It's very hard to communicate to the top what is actually happening at the grassroots level anymore. They seem to be detached from a lot of where the new culture is emerging. And a lot of that, I think, is that they just didn't make the social media jump, like that's my feeling. And I know that's a very odd way to phrase this when we're always talking about rights and liberties and blah, blah, blah. But to me, it feels like a pre-internet organization that is trying to remain pre-internet and they're not engaging at an individual level like they should. And therefore not only are they coming off more poorly than perhaps even their own behavior or perhaps their behavior is that bad. Who knows? Because we have such poor communication with them, but also they almost never seem to know where the potholes are. And so they put their feet right in them and not understand why everybody's upset. Now, Tim, I understand where, where you come from here and I would like to allow you some time to, to speak. And if there's not much you can say about this specific thing because of obligations, I, I would like to give you some time to also talk about how members, because Othias just kind of pointed out, we don't have a great ability to, to communicate with the executive branch or the, the board of directors, uh, how people can possibly get involved more and what is important for members of the NRA. Yeah. Firstly, Sean, um, you know, my role as a, as a director on the board is to listen primarily and then speak internally. And Elthias, I absolutely, what you're telling me is a lot of what I hear. Uh, the concern about the lack of being in touch. And I, unfortunately spend too much time on my cell phone and on social media because that's where I'm getting a lot of the feedback. Now it does lead to a lot of phone calls and other things, but what I find out is that most people say, well, I posted something on Facebook. So now the NRA knows, or I shared with my friends. So they're now educated, which those things are really important and you shouldn't not do them everybody. But what you do need to do is actually write the board of directors 
Now, we don't stand outside of Congress and, 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 and scream and yell at the building itself. Well, you go to Washington, D.C., and you stand outside that really cool building with tons of history and yell at the building, hey, you're doing it wrong. You're not paying attention. You don't do that. You actually write individual uh, – you write your representative. And in the NRA's case, all directors represent all members. We're at large. So I, I did write an article in Anna Lind in January about that, and I will absolutely share that with you. Sean, maybe you can put that in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, but – uh, guys, we need to hear from you. And it can't just be me that you write to. I'm glad to take your letter. I'm glad to read it. It often leads to phone calls, which is not a problem because, Othias, you're not wrong. There is a detachment, but the detachment is coming from the other side. There are approximately 2.2, the number is higher than that, million voting members of the NRA, and about 8 to 6% of them vote every year for the board. So we have problems on both sides. And a lot of it's well, they don't listen, they don't care. Well, are we getting the NRA we deserve and want? Well, that's up to you. I'm listening. I need you to make sure that other people are listening because these concerns that the members are having, I'm listening. I hear you. Um, but the board is made up of 76 people. It's a large puzzle and we only speak as one voice. So speak, you know, I wasn't my, I didn't feel it was my place to talk at the members meeting at the last, at the last annual meeting, which happens on Saturday, but I was certainly there listening because it was my job to listen. And I saw uh, both sides and I saw people being upset and dissatisfied. And, and I believe that those things needed to be vetted and said. So I, I'm not going to tell people to be quiet because my place is to listen. Now, internally, I, I share my opinions uh, with, with the NRA. Uh, that's not a problem. That's what I signed up for. So keep it up. If you have concerns, if you have issues, we need to hear from it beyond the keyboard. So Matthias, you're not wrong. I'd say up the volume. So what is the process for that? Because I have a, I have a concern with that as far as the NRA is set up. So far as you can write uh, emails to the secretary, you can, I mean, I, I personally have an address that is available on my website if you want to write me specifically, but uh, the way that the best way to do it is to send people say, well, I want to send an email. Cool. Send that email. And, and there is an email address of which I will give to Sean, so that he can share. It's literally directions on how to do that, but also print out that email and send it to the NRA, but address it to individual board members. Uh, I get that the process is not easy. Now, we before we were talking, that before we went live, we were talking about the volume. I'm glad to take the volume, guys. I, I, I'm up late reading stuff. It's not a problem. Share it. Share if you have a if you have an interest in your competitive shooter, write a competitive shooter board of director. Uh, if you uh, me, I, I do grassroots politics, and I don't get to shoot firearms as much as I would like. But um, take the time to reach out to people who you think should be listening to you. We should all be listening to you, or at least replying to you. But um, I I hear you in the concern. If it were too direct, if people could just there there has to be a process for people to engage. Uh, to take a little bit of time to do it, just like there is in Congress. So I will most definitely share that link with you, Sean, is the, is the directions on how to communicate with the board of directors. So since I've been a director in 2015, I have received 28 emails directly through this process and 14 letters. Wow. Mic drop. What? Yeah. Now, now I, to be fair, now to be my, for my advocacy, I'm, I'm surprised you got 14 and I would have burned them. Because I run an organization in which I have to take emails, I have to take Facebook, I have to take Instagram, I have to take it through Patreon. I have to, like, I've got 17 points that as an individual person responsible for my organization that I have to pay attention to, and I don't even have a secretary or anything else that's associated with that. So my problem is with the NRA as an organization, they will fail if they do not adapt. They need to have online username, login, and voting. They need to stop doing everything through the mail. You're not going to get the next generation to go fill out a letter. They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to sign checks. They are damning themselves to extinction if they do not not only adapt new technology, but leverage it. And this is the problem that everybody has with the organization, because the only way to get in and change it is to go boot up some DOS computer and learn legacy code so that you can speak to it because it's gotten so out of date. It does not integrate with Internet 2.0. No, your, 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 your point is taken. The concern is that we know that, uh, computers can be hacked, that elections can be hacked. Uh, the NRA is very concerned, uh, rightfully so that elections can be hacked. So they've kept the paper ballot process paper for a reason. It's, it's harder to manipulate. Uh, that is a concern. Um, 
that is a legitimate concern because we've seen these kind of things happen in state elections and whatnot. That's, that's fair. The paper ballot ser- system has served well enough to have a organization that is trusted by less than 50 percent of its base constituency. And so that, it's a problem. I get it. I get it. Unfortunately, we, we're seeing grassroots swells in other organizations, and that's where the funds are going to go. As people are going to see no results, and they're going to push their money where it belongs. So, so that's their problem. They they're going to have to adapt. And to be a hundred percent clear, like we did not do that episode because we we were trying to crush the NRA or we don't believe in the NRA. I want a strong NRA. The NRA is a members organization. I'm a member. I'm proud to be a member. I'm literally wearing an NRA shirt right now. And it doesn't matter to me at all. I, I am disappointed, uh, angry with the leadership that, that exists there. And, but it doesn't make me want to walk away. It makes me want a stronger NRA. And I, I would prefer, I would prefer to see it brought back in alignment with the current gun owners' interests. That is my big concern is that when you have the most nationally recognized and politically recognized advocate speaking in a way that the average gun owner does not appreciate and does not want to hear, because now, I'm being represented by an organization that I do not agree with. And so when they start making bargains that not just me, but most people do not agree with in that constituency, that's the time to no longer have them as the negotiator. They either need to bring their negotiations back in line with our concerns, or they need to stop being the chief negotiator. I'd prefer to see it, you know, salvage, but it's just trending further and further from that line. The deeper we get in, it has not gotten better in the past two years. It's gotten worse. Let All me right. say to this, to that, uh, I hear you. So people, folks, those who are listening, your right to show up at the members meeting and express these opinions is vitally important. And although the paper ballot may be kind of a pain, you need to participate in the NRA elections. And the other thing is that when you get a ballot, you're allowed up to 25 choices. I will recommend to you that you choose far fewer choices and people that you believe in who are applying, who are visible, and who you know what are doing. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for because you have different things that are important to you. But the NRA can only change and only become that organization to represent most things. We're never going to be 100%. But if we don't take the time, as inconvenient as that might be, and really it's sitting down on your couch for 20 minutes looking at a ballot and doing this. The ballots always come out pretty much in late January, right around SHOT Show time. Uh, for those who get to go to chat show, yay. Um, and it's fun, but, um, take the time to fill this out. It's a real thing. They're real people. And people say, well, I don't, how do I find people out? A good way to do that is to get into your search engine and type their name, comma, NRA or comma competitions, things that are important to you. Now don't put NRA board of directors because you're only going to be able to find what they've done on the board of directors. So don't narrow your search, make it wider. But vote for who you're seeing, who's participating, who's out there. That's going to matter, and that is how you need to make a difference now. And that voice at the members' meeting, I think it was discovered this year, uh, is that there is is an opportunity to be heard. That is your time to speak directly to the body at large. Take that, because, Matthias, if we want those changes, if you want to participate in that, it's not going to happen at the speed we want it to, clearly. But what it will do is it will affect that change. It has to grow. It has to change. It must remain relevant. There are only five and a half million uh, firearms uh, people who choose to be members of the NRA, yet they, the association probably should be probably 15 or 20 million. They're, the NRA is going to have to earn that. I'm okay with that. All right. Good stuff. Thank you, guys. And again, uh, we like shooting at firearmsradio.tv. NRA Under Fire is the episode we did, kind of outlining everything that went on over the weekend of the NRA and, and the and the lead up to the NRA annual meetings. We're going to move directly into our full auto news segment because Othias has a story that he wanted to talk about before we take off from here. Othias, Pennsylvania woman charged with shooting a BB gun at kids. Like what? Again, I want to know who gets these reporting jobs because there's so little data. You know what I mean? Like. <laughs> yes. Because it's it's basically – it's kind of written top down where it's like people are outraged and they're so mad. I don't care how mad people are. I want to know what happened. And apparently a cafeteria worker – it says Marie McWilliams. Mm-hmm. Wait, 30 years old? That's awfully young. Um, anyway, uh, no, Marie is a cafeteria worker. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Anyway. So she apparently, and this was off duty, not at the cafeteria, was shooting a quote unquote BB gun at children playing on a Uh, playground. Yeah. On the playground. 
she was arrested and uh there was uh let's see who is it a woman was shooting at the child and his friends on the playground said he could hear bbs flying past his head now of course i wonder if that's a bb gun or a like an airsoft gun i know that that's immediately confused by <laughs> most people uh cuz one is much more severe like a bb gun is potentially dangerous depending on how fast we're talking about here but the airsoft gun it could hurt a little bit i mean if you got them in the eye that's no good yeah but apparently uh, the, the big quote here where someone was saying, you know, you know, why would you do that? Essentially, she goes, well, if I don't get them now, I will get them tomorrow at lunch. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I actually missed that part of the story. Yeah. That, yeah. if I, I heard the quote was, if I don't get them now, I will get them tomorrow at lunch. What? <laughs> and I'm just like over here, like, give me my sloppy Joe woman. And apparently she was mad at them for cursing at her and calling her names. So I can imagine there's some sort of rolling animosity between her and the children. I'm trying to find, I don't think it says the children's age in here, which is, I mean, they were at a playground. So yeah, but you, you can be 16 and sitting around a playground and that would make you an even more like, here's the thing. If it's like a, an eight year old at the playground and you're shooting BBs at them, we got a real big problem. But if you're a 16 year old punk that's hanging out at a playground, we probably aren't that upset that somebody's shooting at you with a BB gun. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. I, I would love to know the actual context on this story though, because it's, it sounds so pumped up, but it is really, I mean, I, the quote just got me so much. If I don't get them now, I will get them tomorrow at lunch. <laughs> Tim, is she feeding them BBs maybe too? I don't know. I don't understand. God, it's, I'm confused it's unhealthy. By the whole, a whole relationship is unhealthy. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you <Gosh. laughs> like, I'm extra sloppy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! All right, kids are setting off the metal detectors at school. Well, I'm going to tell you this must be a generational thing because again, I need to know the age because at any age over nine or ten, if the cafeteria lady started shooting at me with a BB gun, I feel like that would be the highlight of my month. Like I just yeah. like she's shooting us. I'm going to go get a BB gun and shoot her. Like it would have been a whole thing. My friends and I, we used to shoot BB guns at each other across a, a ditch. Like that was our thing. Like go out there and shoot at each other with BB guns. Oh yeah. No, you get that thing where it's just like, did you pump that three times? I swear I didn't. I swear you did. I'm going to pump mine four. And I'm <laughs> yeah. it it's literally an inch in my flesh. You pumped it like nine times. Right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's all we, all the time we've got tonight. But before we leave, I always want to give you guys the opportunity to tell people how they can keep in touch with you, what you've been up to and all that good stuff. Othias, we'll start with you. I'm just making the show. We had a big project lightning with Ian where we ran through a bunch of light machine guns. So people are probably aware of that, but otherwise it's the same old history. I've actually been trying to get geared down and sort of put things into production so that I have a, a lead so I can actually do these sort of special projects without having a heart palpitation in the process. So it's, it's by the book. Just come on and check out some history. We're still working through world war one. And then uh, we're considering gearing up another series for 2020 where we might do some, uh, uh, history of the repeating shotgun. We're hoping to see if we can't sort of prearrange everything to do one in chronological order this time, because I've always wanted to do a series in chronological order, but yeah, just good old history. Good stuff. I, uh, I did watch the project lightning stuff and it, it was really good. Uh, I think may outdid you guys all the time. That's, that's just my opinion. Uh, that is crap. <laughs> she can not, like, the, the upper body strength required by this stuff is insane. It, it, it was really, really interesting. And, I think you actually just coined a new term, a new motto for you guys. It's a uh, CN Arsenal primer hashtag same old history. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. Where can they find it all? Just uh, Google primer. Or- yes. Yeah, CN Arsenal or primer. Just start naming some world war one guns and put them into YouTube searches. Cause it'll turn up like our keywording. So terrible. Like it, it, we can't spell anything. You can't spell if you can't spell CN <laughs> Arsenal, but if you guess uh, a good bit of the time, the search engine will figure it out. So Wonderful. Thanks for being here, buddy. Yeah. Uh, Tim, I think he has more fun on a day-to-day basis than I do. I, I, I think so, too. Uh, he has more fun than I do as well. Tim, where, where can people keep up with everything that you're doing and, and get in touch with you? Yeah, the best way to keep up with what I'm doing, I'm pretty active on Facebook. Um, Timothy Knight, um, NRA, is a good way to find me. Uh, you look for a little chess piece that looks like a knight. That's my public figure page. I'm also on Instagram. I do love the Instagram. It's Timothy Knight NRA. And you can see what I'm up to there. I keep my website, uh, Timothy and uh, Knight, which it's, excuse me, it's Knight, the number four, NRA.com, kind of the longer version of stories and what I'm up to and where I've been, you know, cause I'm kind of always running to be relevant to the members. But, um, yeah, I, I, what I'm up to this fall is an election in Virginia. So I'll probably spend some time in Virginia because it's going to be a good primer for 2020. 
And um, recently, since I do like to uh, shoot shoot guns and educate people on firearms, uh, did a shotgun and rifle instructor course uh, with our good friend Judson, and uh, that was a lot of fun too. So good way to bring relevance back is to let people see that I'm not only a politician and an, an engagement of this stuff, but I actually enjoy it too. So that's what I'm up to. All right. I love it. Thank you guys so much for being here. Definitely. Uh, if you're listening, check these guys out online and get in touch with the NRA board of directors, let them know. And, uh, we'll get that article in the show notes. I think it's incredibly important, uh, as members that we, we need an organization that represents us and the way that we do that is by communication. So let's do a better job of that and see where that gets us. Uh, again, primer world war one, crazy old guns, stuff like that is how you can find Othias. Uh, leave us a review in iTunes. Leave us your feedback on our website, firearmsradio.tv. You can check out Second Call Defense at firearmsradio.tv slash SCD. You can check out Patriot Patch Company at patriotpatch.co. And as we always say, This Week in Guns is produced by Kenny Ortega and is a production of the Firearms Radio Network. We'll see you next week.